Hello, BookTube. I've got some mail for you today on a gray, overcast Saturday. I think we're in the trough between two rainstorms. One came last night and was brief. I think the next one will be longer. Uh, but before I get to the mail, I wanted to clear up a problem that I myself created in yesterday's video. Uh, involving an incident that definitely involves BookTube. Now, I have received some very wise counsel that it would probably be pointless to talk about this, to address it in any great detail, and I think I sort of agree with that. But I didn't want to leave you completely in the dark, especially the, the large number of you don't, didn't appear to have any idea what I was talking about. Uh, uh, this week, a, a booktuber uh, was arrested on horrifying charges and is currently being held without bond pending trial. And an old friend of mine said years ago about a, a disturbingly similar case, that these are like cluster bombs of trauma. In a, in a neater world, they would, the, the effects would be very limited, but they're not because the, the particular horrifying charges involved here required an enormous amount of concealment. And so, in addition to this guy's friends and his family and his children and his employees and his clients, in addition to all of them being affected, BookTube is very much also affected. He had a popular, chatty, friendly, interactive, welcomed channel. Plenty of booktubers said wonderful things about his videos. Plenty of booktubers did collaborations with him. He did collaborations with plenty of booktubers. That involves us. Might not want that to be true, but it does. And since we're involved, we're allowed to feel it. It's not restricted to one single shard of that cluster bomb. Anybody affected by it is allowed to feel it. This points straight at the heart of the idea of the booktube community because for years that community harbored a monster without the slightest idea that we were doing that. It's impossible for this to happen, for something like this to happen, in addition to the tragedy that it is for his friends and his family and of course for the children involved. It's legitimate to also think about that. It's legitimate also if you are part of that community that welcomed this guy to feel rocked by it, to feel genuinely rocked by it. Uh, but I wasn't, I didn't give any details yesterday. I, I just, I just uh, alluded to it in passing as an explanation for what I thought would be obvious in the video. It turned out it was obvious in the video, which was that I wasn't feeling my normal exuberant self. I'm still not, very much not. Um, and because I didn't go into details in that video, it led to a lot of guessing in the comments field. I got a lot of um, very warm and supportive emails and Voxer messages from a lot of you wondering if I was feeling unhealthy or if something bad had happened to me or, or God forbid, Frida. And that was really touching. I got uh, on that video some shitty comments as well. And I guess if I don't want to get comments like that, the only alternative I have is not to put myself in the way of them, not to make videos. But if I'm going to, well, I guess they're a part of the game. You're going to get people chasing a 15 second dopamine hit by leaving a shitty comment. Uh, but the rest of you, I, I've debated this a lot. I've, I've asked for advice in a lot of quarters and I, I don't really, I think I am reluctantly coming along to the agreement that it's probably useless or maybe even more harm than good to talk about this at great detail. Uh, but I wanted to clarify that it's none of those things, that it's, that it's not any of the things that all of you were good enough to worry about. Uh, and one, one very wise person pointed out to me that the, the existence of that worry is something I ought to be clinging to in the midst of the doubts that this story is giving me about the so-called booktube community. Of course, this story strikes at the very heart of the idea of the booktube community. An old friend of mine who deals with these kinds of monstrous crimes uh, told me that for these particular people, concealment is everything, literally everything. They can't just be glib 
that it has to be ironclad because the nature of the offense is so horrifying that it's life or death. Uh, so that friend, that old friend of mine, was not at all surprised when I told her that none of us knew, that we had, we had no idea whatsoever. It's, she wasn't surprised about that at all, but she was one of the first people, this was two nights ago, she was one of the first people to tell me, taking time to feel your own kind of impact from a trauma cluster bomb is totally legitimate. You don't just walk it off. You don't just brush it off. It's you, you gave a certain amount of trust and acceptance to someone who very much did not deserve it. And you didn't know, but that doesn't matter. You, you're still going to feel fooled. You're still going to feel distrustful. You're still going to feel vulnerable. That in no way is meant to downplay the suffering of other people affected by this cluster bomb. As some of the shittier shitty comments yesterday uh, implied. Uh, but the main thing, I'm, I shouldn't be, be dwelling on those comments. Of course, that's if you, if you have been on social media at all, you know that's the way of things, right? You can get a hundred positive comments. It's the one shitty comment that's going to be bothering you. I shouldn't be concentrating on that. What I'm meaning to say here is that that is the rough outline of what happened. And so it, it doesn't, it isn't anything that happened to me, except to the extent that that happened to me. It isn't anything about me. It isn't anything about Frida. I wanted to set a lot of your hearts at ease. It's just that. We lost a booktuber who turned out to be a monster. And that's deeply, deeply unsettling. I, I'm sure I'm not the only person out there, the only booktuber, the only maker of videos out there who feels this way. I'm sure I'm not. Plenty of people watched and loved his videos, which, as far as I know, at the making of this video is still up. Uh, because... Of course, he doesn't have access to his social media, and I'm guessing that everyone in his life was completely blindsided by this. So this last thing they're going to be thinking of, the videos will probably be up for a while. Uh, but everybody, there were thousands and thousands of people who watched and loved his videos, and there were lots and lots of booktubers. Uh, not only in general, but in his specific niche interest, who thought they knew him, thought at least that they, they knew that he wasn't a monster. So... That's what it is. That, that's the broad outline of the subject. I didn't want to just be mysterious about it and just move on as if nothing had happened. Something has happened. It's, and it's important for me to think about it. It's just, I think the, the pieces of advice that I've been getting telling me that it's, it's really not all that important for me to be thinking about it in public on camera, that advice is probably true. Uh, but that's what it is. I wanted to make sure before we get to the mail and hopefully genuine smiles, uh, because nothing we can do about this. People get fooled all the time. Uh, that old friend of mine said, that's what these monsters do. They fool people. They can't exist without it. Don't beat yourself up. Uh, she herself is a, a trained professional in this field, has been fooled a number of times, just a number of times. She said, you just have to learn to roll with it. Uh, it's impossible to avoid a, a kind of a feeling of, of involvement because Anyway, anyway, that's what it was. I wanted to make sure, before I get to the mail, I wanted to clarify, at least in general, without, without specifics. And we don't have to touch on the subject again, but I, I wanted to clarify that it, a lot of you were worried about me personally or about Frida, and it's not. It's not that. So you don't need to worry about that. You, this, this news will, I think, become more widespread and more widely discussed on YouTube in the coming days and weeks, but, it wouldn't, but not, probably not by me. Uh, but anyway, I really appreciate the concern. To, to, for the 99% of people who, who expressed concern. I really appreciate that. So let's, let's now we've, we've, we've cleared that up. It wasn't me, it wasn't Frida, but it, it was still legitimate. A cluster bomb of trauma went off. Now, well, I am not in any way close to the primary victim. The primary victims, of course, are this guy's victims. The secondary victims are everybody around him, friends, family, relatives, clients, employees, that had no idea and are directly affected. Something, ha something has gone straight out of their lives, but it's also legitimate to say that something has gone out of BookTube and that it affects BookTube. Uh, and I'm a BookTuber. <laughs> right now, I'm a BookTuber. So anyway, that's the subject. Let's, let's move on from there. There's nothing that any of us can do about this. Uh, Feel free, any of you who are decent enough to comment, 
to me, email me, Voxer me, instead of chasing a 15-second dopamine hit by leaving a shitty comment, feel free to do that. I'm not, I'm not saying the subject is off limits. I'm just saying it's probably not fodder for videos. Uh, but anyway, we're going we're gonna to move on. <laughs> that extensive throat period. We'll move on to the mail. Uh, the, the, package that, the pile that I found for me this morning, assembled for me uh, last night while I was reading, I was doing my best to read myself out of this. And uh, reading works. Reading works. Frida works. Uh, the first two things in this pile are literary periodicals, which directly affect me. They, I have been dealing with literary periodicals, editing them and appearing in them for a long, long time. These are two of the best. I got the, the latest London Review of Books, uh, which starts right off with a, uh, a three-part roundup review. The review is by Claire Bucknell, who's, who I really like her, her reviews. And uh, it's a three books about Lord Byron, not one of which I have. These, review, these roundup reviews can be a little bit maddening because uh, they're inevitably tempting to book section editors. You've only got so much room. Even in London Review, you've only got so much room. And your, your heart is always broken by the books that you can't cover. <laughs> Believe it or not, that is true. Except in book, book review editors who are just calloused over, it, it, your heart is broken for the books that you can't cover. So if you see two or god forbid three books that are on the same subject you're going to try and find somebody to do all three of them at once i i generally the reason that i that i sound a little deprecatory is because these roundup reviews usually aren't of course they can't be as good to each individual book as an individual standalone review would be uh but nevertheless the books are byron and the poetics of adversity reading byron poems life politics and Byron's Don Juan, the liberal epic of the 19th century. And I want all three of those. <laughs> the one is by, the first one is by Cambridge University Press. The other one's by Liverpool. And the third one is also by Cambridge University Press. I don't, I typically don't get anything from Cambridge University Press and nothing from Liverpool. They, they don't have American publishers, these books. And I don't think, I don't, doubt, I doubt that Cambridge will distribute them in America either. Lord Byron, I, I doubt it very much. We'll see. But uh, I, I restrict my ambit to U.S. books almost always, so I won't be going afield to get these. Once upon a time, when Book Depository was still in business, I might have been tempted. But I, I won't. I won't go go afield and get them. I will put out feelers on Monday uh, to Cambridge University Press. It's possible that there are copies in this country. It's possible that they plan on a limited publication in this country, in which case I'd love to see those. Liverpool? <laughs> no, no. That's, unfortunately, that's one of the three that I really want. And then the other, the other journal that I got is the TLS, the London Times Literary Supplement, which is the greatest uh, English language literary journal of them all. And this has all sorts of stuff in it. All sorts of stuff. The, the TLS is always wonderful. It leads off with Jesse Armstrong doing a review of Michael Lewis's book on Sam Bankman Freed, his book Going Infinite. Uh, I haven't read the review yet. I'm really hoping that it's not the soft, embracing hug that the book has got from so many critics who are just trained to like Michael Lewis. The minute you realize as a book critic that you have been trained to like something, that's when you should either bow out of the review or take a serious cold shower look at that training because that training disserves your readers. Um, I'm hoping that it's not that. It's a horrible book. Just, it's not just a horrible subject. It's a horrible book. Uh, a collusive book. But I haven't read it, so we'll see. Uh, and that brings us to uh, the packages. There are no paper envelopes this time around, just cardboard envelopes and a big box at the end. The box could go one of two ways. <laughs> I think I think it's from a publisher. I think I, it's a finished copy of something we've seen on this channel before that would require a box of its own. It's enormous. But it could also be from one of you. I haven't actually looked. Uh, but the first one, the first package, is almost a personal insult. <laughs> that is as thin as a pencil. There is There cannot be anything good in here. Once upon a time, I would have said a package this thing could only be good if it contained a publisher's catalog. But they don't happen anymore in paper with staples. They they just don't. They, they happen electronically instead, and thank God for it. They're interactive electronically. It's so much easier to uh, to request things and talk about things. It just, it's an entirely improved thing for them to be electronic. Uh, so, but that leaves only, you know, that leaves only, I was going to say, that leaves only a slim volume of poetry. That's exactly what this is. Uh, that's exactly what this is. Uh, look at the size of this thing. Ridiculous. So this comes out in March. 
and this is Silver Poems by Rowan Ricardo Phillips. Silver Poems. This is... God help us, that can't be right. Oh, that just can't be right. Uh, okay, well, I don't know for sure. This is a, this is an, 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 a review copy, so I don't know for sure. But this it, this the back of this thing says that its price will probably be twenty six dollars in hardcover. This is sixty one pages long. Uh, but let let's hear about the book. S although, uh, as we've pointed out before on this channel, the, the people who write the pub sheets for contemporary poetry, what are they supposed to say? <laughs> How are they supposed to work their way from one end of the pub sheet to another without speaking nonsense? How are they supposed to do that? Uh, it's not like this is going to be about the Battle of Waterloo. <laughs> right? uh, silver is the work of a poet operating at peak performance, a fluid movement through form and theme, taking attributes from its eponymous metal. Reflective or opaque, of worth, and yet also, in a sense, second. It is rife with productive contradiction. See what I mean? What does any of that mean? Uh, it is a collection that builds in movement toward a lyric core, a concept album of a book that simultaneously can be put in one's back pocket, cracked open on any occasion with ease. Okay. It is the search for adequate objects reflected in pure poetry, the hunt for a lyric core, a language stripped of the prosaic. Okay. Well, like I said, it's an uphill battle when you're writing about these kinds of things. There's not much you can say, because these poems won't be about anything. They won't have any, almost certainly won't have any form that you can describe or that you can name. <laughs> so they want to, it's, it's a tough job out there for, for a publicist if you're writing about this sort of thing. Uh, I'll still give it a try. I mean, it's next year, so I won't give it a try this year. But this next one is also distressingly thin. It's got a little bit more weight to it. So uh, I guess the, the irony here would be that this is a finished copy of a slim volume of poetry, but maybe not. We'll see. We'll see what this next one is. What have we got here? Oh, no, it's just a book. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a book of poetry at all. It's, it's just a book. It's just a thin book. That's all. Uh, so uh, this is going to be... 256 pages, all right. Uh, this comes out uh, in March. This is by Robert Tsai, and this is Demand the Impossible, One Lawyer's Pursuit of Equal Justice for All. Uh, and in this book, it, he traces Stephen Bright's remarkable career to explore the legal ideas that were central to his relentless pursuit of equal justice. For nearly 40 years, Bright led the Supreme, the Southern Center for Human Rights a nonprofit that provided legal aid to incarcerated people and worked to improve conditions within the justice system. Uh, okay. Uh, all right, I'm a little bit... <laughs> I, I, I'm not familiar with this person, and the pub sheet spells the name in two different ways, so one of you is going to have to help me out here. Is it Stephen Bright or is it Stephen Blight? I, I don't know myself. Uh, but whoever it is, argued four capital cases before the U.S. Supreme Court and won each one, despite facing increasingly hostile bench. Organized around these four major Supreme Court cases, each narrated in vivid and dramatic detail. Ooh, that sounds good. That sounds like a good way to organize this thing. Ooh. Uh, the author's essential account explores the racism built into the criminal justice system and the incredible advancements one lawyer and his committed allies made for equal rights. This book reveals how change can be won in even the most challenging times and how seemingly small victories can go on to have outsized effects. Boy, oh boy. Okay, that, that sounds good. That really does. This, this comes out in March. Uh, and it's going, to be, <laughs> it's going to be $30. It's 200 pages longer than the poetry book, but $4 more expensive. I, I, I don't know. I know the, I know the mainstream publishing... Uh, industry is in trouble but uh I, and we've also said it before right on mail halls and on other discussions on this channel that new books are just impossibly priced in the united states they're just impossibly priced you would need to be ex like most other things in this country you'd need to be extravagantly wealthy to be able to walk into a bookstore and buy a book <laughs> it's just and most people i know are not extravagantly wealthy i mean honestly 26 dollars for a 61 page book that you're going to read once. Uh, but anyway, that this, this second one, that, that sounds really interesting. Very good narrative approach to hinge it around f dramatizing 
for Supreme Court cases, because that means you'll get dialogue, that means you'll get interaction between counsel and, and the justices, that means you'll get the scene setting. All of that is heavily, heavily witnessed and documented. So that'll, that'll make, that's a really good choice. Uh, all right, let's move on here. We're getting closer and closer to the bar. Uh, let's see what this next one is. I don't imagine any of these things will be 2023 anymore. I think we've, we've passed that. Uh, okay, yeah, this is for February. This is The Bloody Nightgown and Other Essays by John, Joan Acocalo of The New Yorker. Uh, let's see here. When she received the National Book Critics Circle Nona Balakian Award years ago, her exception speech touched on how an essay about a book differs from a lesser notice of a book. Does it indeed? <sighs> okay. As a lifelong purveyor of those lesser notices, <laughs> I will read on. <laughs> uh, quote, it's very simple, it seems to me. It differs in the way that art differs from what is not art. It should be shapely, it should be deep, as well as personal. Close quote. The essays in this collection, gathering some of her most memorable and essential writing from the past decade and a half, certainly fits this bill. But in that description also leaves out something crucial about her work, how much pure fun it is to read. Now that I can definitely agree with. This is an author who is a first read when you get a new issue of The New Yorker, she's in it. Uh, here, rubbing elbows with one another at the table uh, are the tales of Khalil Gibran, whose book The Prophet has made him the third best-selling poet of all time, behind only Shakespeare and Lao Tzu, uh, despite a tepid reception from critics. Here also is J.R. Ackerley, the erudite mid-century editor, uh, mid-20th century editor and writer who wrote about his dog with a passion that bordered on obscenity. <laughs> no, no, my dog Tulip doesn't border on obscenity. It acknowledges that obscenity is human. And the dogs don't feel it or acknowledge it in any way. Uh, of Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm, the nationalist German brothers, behind the famously grisly fairy tales, as well as Meditations on the Book of Job and Richard Pryor, and in the show-stopping title essay, an examination of the characters who populate the strange ecosystem of Dracula scholarship. I remember that essay. It's going to be fun to reread it. Fun is a good word for this author. She is delightful on the page. As always, through her work, what will keep you turning the pages is her own inimitable voice which is deeper and more personal, right? It's deeper and more personal than the lesser notice of a book. <laughs> All right, so this comes out in February. I needed that laugh. And now, and now officially, while you're watching on this channel, the, the prospective title of my memoirs has changed from Odd Dog to Lesser Notice. <laughs> How can I pass that up, all right, as, as someone who's been generating lesser notices of books for 50 years? <laughs> uh, then we'll move on to uh, the next book. We'll see if this one also contains some good-natured condescension. <laughs> I guess it's possible for condescension to be good-natured. Uh, this is also a 2024 release. So these are all 2024 releases. This is from March. Oh, it's you again. Okay, <laughs> all right. Uh, well, hope springs eternal, right? I have not shut the door on this author. This author has no credit in the Bank of Steve and has uh, also has a poster with his pretty face on it tacked up in the break room. Not notify the police, but watch out for this guy. <laughs> so he has no credit at the Bank of Steve and he's also got a bit of a name there. But I haven't closed the door at all. Perfectly willing to keep trying. Especially since it's an author in translation, and I, I give those a little extra leeway because there, you know, there's, another, there's a third party at the table with us that might be affecting things. Uh, the author is Edouard Louis, who I have reviewed at least once before. I think I thought that my review of one of his books was a haymaker. It was just I thought, <laughs> even though it was in a venue that no one knows about, and that he doesn't care about critics or or me. I thought sure that someone would pipe it up to him. And he would change his ways, but he did not. <laughs> Imagine the nerve. Uh, so this comes out in March. This is his newest book in English, translated by John Lambert. This is uh, called Change. And that chin at the bottom there is our author. No mistaking that. I don't know if his picture will be in this advanced copy. Um, he usually never resists the opportunity to put his picture in his own books. 
This is called a novel. It will under no circumstances whatsoever contain even the smallest stray subatomic particle of fiction. <laughs> this author has never written any fiction. He is not capable of writing fiction. <laughs> but uh, we got to call it something, right? And you call it a novel, people will pick it up. Uh, let's see here. What have we got? I am delighted to share a review copy of Change, the most expansive novel yet by this author, translated from the French by John Lambert, or Lambert. I have no idea how he pronounces it. Hailed as one of the most important voices of his generation. <laughs> He's hailed as one of the most important voices of his generation by Garth Greenwell. And that's all. <laughs> Garth Greenwell's the only, maybe Edmund White <laughs> after a festive dinner, but not, not otherwise. Um, Louis is known for his autobiographical novels, which grapple with forces that have shaped his life, class, sexuality, family. Spoiler here, the, the little Arrested Development narrator's voice, it's just sexuality. <laughs> uh, uh, let's see here. In this book, he writes with a sense of urgency about the perils of leaving behind one's class. Focusing on the transformation of a young man who dares to travel where he does not belong, from poverty to the world of the bourgeoisie and upward. Change also challenges the ideology of the self-made man, illuminating the luck and the generosity of friends that sustain a person severed from his past. In other words, his novels have made him wealthy. How does that change a person? <laughs> That's what this is about. This is the next chapter in his autobiography. This is about how the main character in this novel, who will be called Edward Louis, and who this will be a, this book will be about how he deals with the fact that he has lots of money coming in. Where's the money come from? His earlier novels, who, which will be named in this book. They will have the same titles as Edward Louis' earlier novels. And how will that affect his relationships with his parents? Well, those relationships will be described and the parents will be named. They have the same names as his parents and the relationships are the same as he's been documenting in social media and in letters and emails for the last 10 years. Why you would call this a novel then, I do not know. It's, if, if you called this a, a block of cheese, you still wouldn't spread it on your crackers. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so that's what this is about. This is, it's, not a, it's not a question of class. Class doesn't care about money. It's, it's a question of money. It's a question of, it's not, he's, not, he's not moving up in class. He's not becoming a, nob a nobility. It, what this means is this is a book about what, how his life has changed now that he has money, now that he's a successful author. Uh, some more about the book. Well, if you'd have told us a little about the book at first, the some more would make more sense. Uh, the author longs for life beyond the poverty, discrimination, and violence in his working class hometown. Uh, he experienced borderline poverty, nothing like what some of you have experienced. He experienced only the normal schoolyard name-calling discrimination, and he experienced zero violence. Zero. Uh, so he sets out for school in America, and uh, in Amiens, sorry, and later at the University of Paris. He sheds the provincial Eddie for the elegant new name, determined to eradicate every aspect of his former self. He reads incessantly, he dines with aristocrats, he spends nights with millionaires and drug dealers alike. Everything he does is motivated by a single obsession to become someone else. All right. All right. I guarantee you that is that was not his obsession. His obsession was not to become someone else. It was to have every last person in the world completely and uncritically validate the person he already was. This novel is narrated by with a clear-eyed intensity, reflecting how Edward apprehends the world and fashions a new version of himself to match new environment. Photographs throughout the text documenting the violence of poverty, the stages of his transformation, confront the reader with the reality behind the novel. Where is the novel? Every aspect, every experience in this book was experienced directly by the author, who chronicled them in real time before he wrote them in this book. And in addition to all of that, the author provides photos throughout the book of himself experiencing those things. Where is the novel? Where is the fiction? Just because you call it fiction doesn't mean it is. There is no fiction in here. If you're documenting it with pictures... Anyway... Change is a profound and harrowing book, not only a personal odyssey, a story of dreams and of the beautiful violence of being torn away, you weren't torn away, uh, but a riveting portrait of a society divided by class, power, and inequality. Okay. All right. Well, uh, <laughs> obviously, I am going to continue arguing with this author. 
I wonder how much of my arguments with this, I mean, the, I wonder how many of those arguments would disappear if, if, if he just stopped the lying. And I'm not saying, obviously he's documented his whole life, so he's not lying so much about that. He might be lying about what other people, how mean other people have been to him. The lie is the novel part. If, I wonder how much of my objections to this author would go away if the, if the publisher labeled these as memoirs, which is what they are. I wonder how much of that would just disappear. If, if it weren't so annoying to think, not so much me, but f to think that somewhere along the line, somebody in the marketing department of some publisher thinks that the reading public is so barnyard biddable that, well, our stats show that they buy novels and they don't buy memoirs and we want this to do well, so we'll just call it a novel. What do they know? They won't know anything. They're all dumb. The, somewhere at the uh, high up somewhere in some meeting room, I'm not saying it's the author. I'm, I'm excusing the author from this. But somewhere in some marketing meeting room, was a, deci a decision was made out of staggering condescension. And that bothers me. That bothers me a lot. This is not a novel. There is nothing in there. It's documented with photos, for Pete's sake. There's not, a, there's not a single thing in here that's fictional. I wonder how much of my objections would go away if you just stopped lying about it. Uh, but they wouldn't all go away because this is a bad writer. <laughs> Martin Louis can't, couldn't write his way out of a wet paper bag. Unless that's all the translator. We'll see. I, I will give this another try. I've tried his others. I'll try to remember to leave a link uh, to any reviews of him that I've done. Although if I forget to do that, uh, just keep in mind the usual approach. The, the normal approach that I always suggest is just type in all the available information into Google. Right? I, I know you use Google all the time, so do I, so does everybody, so you, you probably already know how to use it. But you have to give it, the more you give it, the better it will be. And also, you have to learn to avoid giving it things that will just confuse it. So, in this, in this case, the best approach possible would be Steve, Donahue, Edward, Louis. Don't bother, don't, don't write in review, don't write in what did Steve think of or anything. Don't give it stuff that's going to confuse it. Just those four words, we'll call it up. But I, I'll try to find it. And maybe clean it up. Because if it was on an old website and it was transported, we did a mass porting of content to stevedonahue.com, which is my website. And uh, I, ideally, I want everything that I've ever written to be on that website, no matter where it was. Because after a month or so, I get the, the rights revert back to me anyway, no matter where it was, in Boston Globe or whatever. Ideally, I want everything to be there, but the mass porting can crush the, any kind of formatting. So that you know, ideally, I need to go through each piece word by word, sentence by sentence. So I try to find them first and clean them up if it needs that, but I'll try to remember to do that. But those are the books, and they are all next year, and they're all fairly thin. That's that's not even one whole night's reading if I wanted to do it. Uh, uh, and then we come to the box. And I'm, I'm intentionally not going to look. <laughs> I'm not going to look because I don't want to... I don't want to know. This This could be one of two things. This is the Schrodinger's cat of rule number one. Uh, because rule number one on this channel is uh, don't send me any books. Unless you clear it with me first. Don't do it. Don't see a book in a bookstore and think, oh, Steve likes books. I should get this for him. Because Steve really likes books. He really, really likes books. Which means it's not the same thing as, you know, your Uncle Eustace, where he really likes books, but he hasn't bought one in ten years. So anything you get him is likely to be a bullseye. That's not true with me. I get a lot of books from publishers. I get a lot of books on my own. Uh, so if you clear it with me ahead of time, sure. Although if you do, if <laughs> a lot of you know this from first-hand experience, if you email me to clear it with ahead of time and I don't have the book and I also want it, I'm going to do my best to talk you out of going to the bother of mailing it to me. It's so ridiculous to mail me to mail me books. It's so ridiculous. People are so generous anyway. Uh, with your, well, as I've learned just in the last 24 hours, you're so generous with yourselves. You're so generous with the things that really matter to me, your friendship, your support, your encouragement. You really don't need to be standing in line at a post office and mailing me books, even if I do want it. But that's rule number one. Rule number two is send me your tech. Or maybe rule number one is Steve is always right. Uh, I've, I should number them. I should make a list. Uh, for newcomers, I should make a list. I should make a video of it. Uh, but one of the rules, after rule number one, one of the rules is send me your tech. If you have tech that you don't want that still works, you power it up and it still works. So it's not defective or broken in any way. If you have tech that you have that you don't use anymore, you've upgraded, send it to me. <laughs> there, I don't mind you waiting in line at the post office. Uh, this could either be that or it could be from a publisher. There is a big finished copy that I am still waiting for. 
that would have a box of its own. So, oh no, this isn't from a publisher. This is this is from one of you because this is this is very much uh, informally packed. Oh, <laughs> okay, it's rule number two or whatever, whichever rule that is. Oh, one of you sent me text. All right, I know exactly who sent this, and I could not be more grateful. Oh my. Of course, you're just acting, the person who sent this, you're just acting out of generosity. It's not the first time. You had no idea that you were also engaged in perfect timing. Oh my God, the smile this sort of thing puts on my face. I need today more than I have in weeks. <laughs> so thank you so, so much. Uh, this person sent me two pieces of tech. How wonderful. All right, so the first piece of tech <laughs> that this person sent me uh, is a Kindle. The Kindle Basic. Kindle, uh, the, this is the uh, the Kindle e-reader. Of course, it's right here, you know, on by my bedside. Uh, the, the Kindle e-reader, <laughs> this is something I got for free from one of those aggregator sites. Brace, brace! <laughs> An airplane captain wrote a whole book about how to up your chances of surviving a plane crash. Uh, and you see, this is in denim blue. This is the newest Kindle Basics, $100. And uh, they say that these Kindle Basics are uh, made with a high percentage of recycled material, recycled plastics. A lower percentage with the denim blue than with the normal black, but I liked the denim blue, so I said to heck with the dolphins, I got it anyway. Uh, I I was rereading that uh, bits of that of that book, Brace, Brace, because yesterday I was on the fainting couch here at Hyde Cottage with Frida when there was a a roar in the sky. Honestly sounded like it was just about twenty or thirty feet above the rooftops here. I went online, it, it, it came and then went. It was a roar that came, it crested and went. Frida perked up her head. She had never heard anything like that before. I had never heard anything like it before. I went online and looked around to see uh, late breaking stuff like that. I don't know of any good places to do that sort of thing. So it sounded very much like a plane deviated from the normal pattern of uh, landing at Logan Airport and cruised over the housetops here. It sounded very much like that. And if it was that, well, then maybe it was the pilot having difficulty. I don't think there was a crash at Logan yesterday. I think that would have made the news. Uh, but I was, I was automatically thinking about that because I just recently read that book. And I was thinking, well, yeah, sure, there are some things you can do, I guess. You can sit in a certain way or in a certain place in a plane or whatnot. The people on the ground are also vulnerable to plane crashes, and I wouldn't have, that thing, if it had plowed into this street of houses, we'd all been wiped out. Uh, I, I, the thing that crossed my mind was the footage of Lockerbie, Scotland, that just whole areas, whole neighborhoods wiped out because a plane raked them over as it hit the ground. Uh, but anyway, anyway, uh, when I saw a Kindle Basic, I, I got the Kindle Basic with the blue, and one of you sent me a Kindle Basic, and this is, this is, a, it has a case, and it's a sleep-wake case, and this is the black Kindle Basic, which I did not have. Uh, this is a much higher percentage of recycled plastic than the blue, because the blue needs the dyes for the blue. This, this is, I think, 70% recycled plastic, so I now have, I didn't have this before, I now have the Kindle Basic in the, the, uh, the just a standard, uh, black, in a nice sleep case, which is great, because uh, the one of the problems with the Kindle is that the uh, power button is directly on the bottom, exactly where you would rest it in the palm of your hand. <laughs> I've lost track of how many times I have accidentally turned this thing off because I'm resting it right there, and that's right where the power button is. That is maddening. That is such a self-evident product design flaw that I would think it would have been caught in ten different preliminary meetings. Uh, and the paranoid, the, the paranoid side of me has said the reason that it wasn't caught is because one way to get around that flaw is to buy a case. And Amazon sells cases. <laughs> but this is another way, because this thing has a case, which means not only will this open up the device, but you have something else to hold on to now. So you won't, you won't necessarily be touching that power cord, right? I can be holding this like this so that I'm, it's not an issue anymore. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. And then this next thing. <laughs> this next thing is even bigger. Also a Kindle. 
This is the Kindle Fire Max 11. Uh, this, this is not a Kindle e-reader. This is not e-ink. This is a, their color tablets. Although Kindle has gone a long way. They made a lot of progress in, uh, in, in, in implementing controls on their Fire tablets, whether it's the little one or the larger one, for you to decrease the strain on your eyes. The, the whole one of the big, uh, big attractions of e-ink reading is that it's less, it's less strainful on your eyes. It's not an LCD screen. Uh, it, it, so, so some people, quite a few people, are vulnerable to that eye strain. I have never felt it myself, but uh, a lot of people have, and they find reading on e-ink devices far more restful. Uh, and also, a lot of people, you know, work on an LCD screen all day long. They don't want to read on a screen when they're when they're on their free time. Uh, and Kindle has incorporated into uh, into their their Fire tablets of any size a whole bunch of brightness controls and warmth controls to eliminate that or cut down on that eye strain. So that it's not as much of a problem as it once was. And this, the Kindle Fire 11, the Kindle Fire Max, uh, is new. This person, I think, I think the sender said that she got two by accident. And, you know, that means it's fair game for sending it to Steve. Uh, and it's different in a lot of ways. For instance, it has an aluminum backing. It's not all, an all-plastic device the way a lot of the Kindle Fire, all the other Kindle Fires are. It's, it's a heavier, more premium thing. It's got a much nicer screen. You're not going to be able to tell, but this is, I don't know if this is, has any power, but it's got a much nicer screen. The screen is, uh, okay, so you've got uh, speakers on one side only. This is meant to be used in landscape mode. Speakers are meant to fire just up into the air. So you've got speakers on one side. Nothing at all on one side. On this, you have brackets and pogo pins for the optional keyboard. You can put a keyboard on this. And then on the other side, you've got literally everything. <laughs> this has literally everything. You have a micro SD slot that can take up to a terabyte of extra storage. That's a lot. You could put a whole bunch of stuff on this device. Uh, you've got the uh, uh, power jack there, which is, I believe, USB-C, which is great because a lot of my stuff is USB-C. You've got the, the uh, power controls there, and you've also got the power button right on the, on the side there. And the power button also doubles, can double if you, if you opt for it, as a fingerprint detector, fingerprint unlocker, so that you just you touch it and the device is unlocked. You have to set it up to do that, but it, it can use that. And it's the very first Kindle Fire that, that has a fingerprint sensor, which gives me a perfect little window to say you absolutely should not do that. You should not give your fingerprints to te to a tech company. <laughs> obviously, you shouldn't do that. I say obviously, and yet thousands and thousands of people have and routinely do. You should not have a tech object constantly listening to you in your home and monitoring what you do. You should not have a tech object dusting your floors and sending back telemetry of the, the exact the dimensions of where you live and pictures of where you live to a tech company, and you shouldn't be giving tech companies your fingerprints. I don't know why I need to say all of this in the 21st century, but I guess I do. That, that You shouldn't be doing that at all. It's just just lock it the normal way. Don't, don't give it your fingerprints. Uh, I don't know to what extent that advice is meaningful because the fingerprint sensor is inside this. It's, it's an actual fingerprint sensor inside the, the on-off button, the power button. Which means that maybe the settings in here that you go into to say, you know, don't take my fingerprint, maybe that doesn't mean anything. Maybe it's taking your fingerprint anyway, but I would like to think that that would be challengeable in court, whereas you giving it to them is not challengeable in court. But you're not going to be able to tell without this thing being turned on, but this is, it, it's got a lovely, lovely screen. It's also got a better Wi-Fi pickup than all the other Kindle Fires. I think it's Wi-Fi 6. Uh, which, you know, you, you might think, well, if, if it's not on a dedicated account of mine, then what difference does it make? It's still going to be Wi-Fi. But that's not true. The main reason why I don't use any Kindle Fire devices in here in the little book room is because they are too far from the router <laughs> at Cottage. They fail to pick up the Wi-Fi when they're this far away from the router. This thing probably will not. It's nice and solid. Uh, Amazon says that, it, that it's three times as durable as an iPad, as the, the similar entry-level iPad. I don't know if they're lying about that. They also say that this glass is triple reinforced, that it's almost unscratchable. I wonder if this does have uh, power so that I could maybe show you the screen. Uh, 
Oh, look at that. You heard that. <laughs> it does have power. It's a little bit of power. I don't know what screen you'll, you'll be able to tell. It's a very overcast, weird day here. It's never going to be bright. It's just going to get gloomier and gloomier the, the further along in the day we go. And then it's going to rain all day tomorrow. So, uh, uh, the fire as a device for me is, yeah, see, uh, I don't know. I have to. I have to set this up. I don't know how how long we'd have to go in to get to uh, to get to. I want to I want to show you what this thing actually looks like, and I guess this is going to be a long video anyway. Uh, here we'll give this one try. If it doesn't work, we'll uh, we'll just skip it. Uh, oh no, that did work. Okay. I should think that Amazon would want, <laughs> uh, oh, okay, never mind. Well, well, you don't have to see the screen. I'll show it to you later. I'll show it to you in a different video. I need to set this up, and it's it's asking for steps. I would think that it wouldn't do that. <laughs> I'm the only one who uses this Wi-Fi. You'd think that once it recognizes this Wi-Fi, it would attach it to a, a, an account that already exists. Uh, the thing, the first thing that I do when I get an Amazon Fire uh, or is install the... Uh, the Google Play Store, which is not on here. This thing is an Android device, but it's it's got a, a heavy skin, an exclusionary skin of Amazon, the Amazon Fire OS on it, that is mainly meant to funnel business into Amazon. <laughs> so, and, and, you know, God bless them, of course, they're, they're entitled to do that. It doesn't have Google Play on it, which means that it really is restrictive for me. It won't be for you. Uh, maybe not so much. Actually, let me... Let me uh, let me go on here just a bit. Just uh, while I'm talking to you, let me go on just so I can show you what I mean. Uh, without the Google Play Store, if you're just using the Google, uh, the Amazon Fire system, you'll get a lot of uh, of good mainstream apps. You'll get a lot more than you ever did in the past. Uh, fi the the Fire OS gets better uh, as it goes along, but it doesn't have Google Play, so if you're taking this thing for ordinary, what's, what the tech channels call content consumption, uh, oh god, oh god, <laughs> well, yes, but, oh god, <laughs> yes, I know what a fire tablet is, <laughs> you get, you get this, okay, skip, yeah, that's what I wanted, <laughs> uh, uh, Okay. Uh, yeah, it's walking me through. Uh, you know, do you do you have our kids going to be using this? Do you want to it to know your location? All that sort of stuff that you've got to do. Uh, I don't want. I want to disable all of that. I want to disable all notifications. I want to. Uh, disable fingerprint ID. I want to disable the, you know, voice activated, always watching spy where I, I want to dis disable all of that. It's taking me through every single offer of everything on Amazon related service. Do you want this? Do you want that? Do you want the, the other thing? A lot of those things I have, but it doesn't know. Uh, so you've just got to, you've just got to go through every single one of these and say, not now, not now, no thanks, not now. Yeah, I don't, I don't want, uh, disable Alexa, uh, disable Alexa, disable Alexa. Okay. Uh, so here we get to the screen and it's lovely. It really is. You're not gonna be able to make it out here, but it's really lovely. And it's got all these apps on it, all these Amazon apps. And you'll notice that in the app store, you have, you have access to a whole bunch of other things, but not what I want, not all of what I want. I want Google on this as a search engine, first of all. I want Google Chrome as a browser. I don't want to be using the Amazon, the Fire system. Uh, I want Google Documents, of course, because I might want to work on this thing. I want YouTube. There is a YouTube app, I think, in the uh, in the Amazon App Store. There is the App Store right there. I think there's a YouTube app, but it's just a portal to the website. It's not. It's not. Doesn't have all the features of the of the actual app itself and a whole bunch of other stuff. 
a whole bunch of other things, uh, major apps that you won't find in the Kindle app store. Fortunately, with Fire devices, it's fairly easy to install, to sideload the Google Play Store. It's fairly easy to do that. There are a couple of ways to do it. I usually just go the route of uh, going online for various AKP sites. You need four of them. You have to do them in order. You have to find them, download them, and then install them in order. And It takes about 10 minutes. At the end of that process, you'll have Google Play on, on this device. And suddenly, it won't be a stock Android, but it will be as close as it can get. This is still going to have... I'm not removing the, the, the Fire OS from this thing. That also is possible to do. But that requires rooting, and that could brick the machine. I don't want to do that, since one of you was kind enough to send it to me. Uh, so instead, you just add... You can just add that on. Uh, and... Uh, we got here let's go what is going on? oh oh i see oh very nice uh i'll just do that and that'll be the first thing that i do on this i won't bother to get used to playing around with it without doing that because i'm going to want those things so you do that i do that first of all and then i've got a, a functional android tablet that isn't just an amazon device uh this is light it's extremely sturdy and the the very generous sender also sent me other things with it because amazon isn't just pushing this as their latest color 11 inch tablet they're pushing it as a productivity device not just content consumption they're pushing it productivity uh and for that end you get a back for this it's a canvas back it's all magnetic you don't need to snap it into a case at all you just line up the camera and it snaps on like that see and it has uh, a kickstand that is posable in a whole bunch it goes about that high but it's posable pretty much anywhere it's really stiff so pretty much any angle that would work for. So you can put a back on this to protect that aluminum backing and also as an angle so that if you want to put this on the counter and play a video while you're making rice or something like that, you can do so. But the kickstand is also useful because there's one other addition that this person also sent me, which is this. It's a keyboard. It's not Bluetooth. It connects it just like the, the Magic Keyboards for the iPads. It, it draws power from the device. So it doesn't require... Bluetooth setup or any kind of independent power source, and that's where those pogo pins are. You line those pogo pins up like that, and suddenly you have a something exactly like my iPad with its magic keyboard. Suddenly you've got uh, a keyboard working with the device. You even got a trackpad. I don't have any idea how good it will be to use, uh, but. It's also a sleep-wake, also, so it has magnets here. That's great. That's terrific. I'm going to use the hell out of this thing. I'm, I'm going to try to, anyway. The one stumbling block, the one, the one potential roadblock here, will be if, for some reason, the installation of the Google Play doesn't work. In which case, one of two things will happen. Either the, the botched installation will destroy the machine, which is very rare. I don't think I know of a case where that happens. It'll just say it doesn't work, that's all, and you'll default to the OS to, the, to the, the, the Fire OS. Either it will destroy the machine, which I really doubt will happen, or it will just prove not to be possible, which I don't see any reason why that would happen. But if it proves not to be possible, well, is there a way for me to be really productive on this device in the Fire operating system? I can't imagine it right now, but maybe, maybe there is. Uh, we'll see. This is certainly, uh, it's certainly worth the effort because it's a major piece of technology. It's a gigantic improvement over their previous Fire tablets, the, the previous, the Fire 10 HD, it's a gigantic improvement over that, an enormous thing. So, you know, the person who sent this, thank you very, very much. I am going to, I will take uh, 20 minutes today, right now, uh, to attempt to put the Google Play Store on here and get the Barnes & Noble app and the Read Era app and the weather apps that I love so much and you know, Google Documents and uh, Instagram and whatnot. I don't see any reason why that won't work. That's worked on 10 different Kindle devices. I don't see any reason why it won't work on this one. Uh, and then once I've done that, well, I'm going to use this thing and see. I'm, I'm going to see how useful it can be. The, the long-term problem here, which the person also sent me a case. That's what this was. But in, if I don't want to use the keyboard, I can just use the case for the, the tablet itself. Very, very nice. If... Uh, the, the only long-term problem with, with Kindles, with t f Amazon Fire tablets of any kind that I have found, not the Kindle e-readers. The, these Kindle e-readers 
are unbelievably good. They're unbelievably good products. I have some now that are years old. I know some of you have some that are better, better than a decade old. They still work just fine. Uh, they're very simple. There's not much complexity to go wrong. The problem with these things is that there is, and the, the, all of the earlier Fire tablets that I have tend to get a little wonky after a bit of time. There seems to be a bit of obsolescence planned into the quality of the internals. They just, they just age. Uh, they don't do anything wrong. They don't break, but they don't, we'll see. This is such an enormous upgrade on all of the previous ones that it might not have that problem. This is clearly Amazon wanting to, to give you, I think this thing retails for like $250. That's pretty cheap for a fully functional tablet. And the, I'm going to see how fully functional this is. I'm going to give it a try. I'm going to put it through its paces because I am a function user. I'm a a productivity bro. <laughs> so uh, I'm exactly who they're going for with this. So we will see. We'll see if that's possible. I'm, certainly they're not going for gamers. This is, I think this has an, uh, an octa-core processor. It's, the screen is very nice, but I don't think the frame rate is good enough for much in the way of really immersive video games. So they're not going for gamers. They're going for people like me. People who like to, to consume content, but who also like to get work done and would like to do it on the same device. All right. Well, if I'm their test audience, we will test it out. So that is the video today. It's extra long because we had stuff to go through and because I'm cussedly long-winded, but also because it's nice. It's, it's nice to just sit here and talk to you. It really is. It really is nice to sit here and talk to you. I want to I wanna thank you all for the, a lot of the comments that you've sent in the last day. Uh, so that is the, uh, the haul for today. We have the Kindle Fire Max, eight, the, their... their uh, New 11-inch tablet uh, with a huge amount of possibility. We also have a Kindle Basic in black, which I didn't have. Then we have the new novel by novel 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 by Edward Louis. We have uh, the Bloody Nightgown. That is fantastic. That's great. That's a high point of the upcoming year. We have Demand the Impossible. Uh, a lawyer deep inside the justice system in America, pleading before the highest court in the land to make it more humane, more responsive. Gotta love that. Seems like an uphill battle in the in the current mind frame of the country, but you gotta love it. And also, uh, Silver Poems, 61 pages long. So all 2024 books, but also something that I'm going to use not only in 2023, but right now. <laughs> so I'm going to wrap this up. Sorry to go on at such length, book two. I doubt there'll be any other videos today, but I will, I will see. I'll wrap this up for now, and I'll be back. Thank you again, book two.